So everybody, that's essentially uh, how everything works in the bear and the bull. Welcome to today's live stream. And uh, we're going to be going over the FOMC and the rate cuts and all this stuff. But we're going to uh, watch that live over on uh, my friend Tom Crown's channel. Today, I just want to go over a couple of things and then we'll do a little Q&A and we'll jump on over there for the big stuff. So before we get started, I think everybody's excited about today. And we were talking about this yesterday and how rate cuts will affect the markets, how the markets will go into the economy, how the economy could potentially slow down, chances of recession, rate cuts, and everything else. You can watch that video if you so choose to later on. But for today, what I'm more concerned about is what is going or are the rate cuts going to be? Now, I made a bold prediction yesterday, and I said that rate cuts will be between zero and 200 basis points cuts. And of course, I say that in jest because nobody knows. And everybody who thinks that they do know, now well, sometimes they get it right. But uh, most of the people do get it wrong. But if we take a look at the uh, CME probabilities, we're taking a look at a 4159% split. And actually, I haven't, let me update this real quick just to be sure. So, so everybody is on, aware, right now the current target rate, or the current rate for the Fed is between 525 and 550, or five and a quarter and five and a half. When I, look at it a different way. And we're looking at a potentially 25 basis points cut, which would put us at 500, 525, or 50 basis points at 475 to 500. Or if you're Elizabeth Warren, you're hoping for 75 basis points. Who knows? So let's just refresh that and see where we're at. 41% say it's going to be 25. Almost 60% say it's going to be 50 basis point cut. However, today, it is roughly the same thing. And this has gone back and forth. And again, everybody's just guesstimating. And what did this do for the markets? Well, you already know this because you have probably looked at your portfolio a little bit and seen that uh, you're down. Yes, you are. And you're down maybe in the last 24 hours if you bought 24 hours ago. It's okay. I did myself. I was dollar cost averaging. And we can see that it's uh, kind of like a buy the rumor, sell the news. Now, this could change on a dime. We could jump up 20% by Bitcoin. Who knows? But for right now, I think we're going to be range bound. We're chopping sideways. Again, I cannot re restate this fact even uh, more so is that I don't expect us to see major liftoff until we get this presidential election in the United States behind us, until we get some more rate cuts, which rate cuts are coming. And before we get more and massive, not a massive, but just more amounts of quantitative easing. So today, you can see across the board, we're quite down 24 hours, 5% for Solana, almost 3% for Bitcoin, Ethereum, also taking the big hit, almost 4%. What are the biggest losers? Let's take a look here. And then not that they're losers, like if you own them, just as far as like a depreciation in value. Again, you don't lose anything unless you sell. Stacks is down 7%, Immutable X, which was the darling of yesterday. I think it was up 15% and now up 8%. But again, if you really want to really care about this, it's all about zooming out and see where you're at and where your potential uh, cost basis is, as you've probably uh, been accumulating over this bear market, which is congratulations. That's essentially what I do. And again, as a reminder, there's a link in the description. Go over to my buddy Tom Crown's channel. He does a great job and he just does it way better than me of covering this. And I, just got to give him props for it. So I want everybody just to go over there and, and watch as he breaks things down. He does a really good job of this. So that's what we have as far as like with the rate cuts. We'll see where it all plays out. But before we get in the Q&A, there's a couple of things I want to go over, which was this. And I know I've been talking about stable coins a lot, and it's not very exciting. But I got to tell you, I, there's something behind the scenes going on. There's something behind the scenes going on for adoption and stable coins are leading us there. But you have to remember, people will say, well, what about, who cares about stable coins? Take a look at the layers that they're actually built on. So this was a report today. BNB chain, Binance chain, introduces gasless stable coin payments initiative. Why is this such a big deal? Well, if you're in third world countries and you're trying to expand the dollar, what is the best, best way to do that? Well, you can set up banks, good luck. Third world countries, there's only so much banks to go around. There's a, there's a reason why they call them the unbankable or bankless. But what you could do is you could do something like with stable coins to push the dollar out because the dollar and these stable coins have to be backed by something. And that could be treasuries. That could be the US dollar. That could be a lot of things. So I see where this is going. And I see this is actually a big win for the United States. But just take a look, just take a look at this. So stable coin transaction implications. The new initiative introduces gasless transfer for Tether, Circles USD, USDC, first digital USD to establish 
fee free transfers that support crypto adoption. And just so everybody's aware, Tether is the lion's share. It's roughly 75 to 76% of the entire market. Circle has a big push as well, somewhere around 15 to 20%. And the rest are kind of just gobbled up by First Digital and PayPal USD. So that's where we're at. But this is why it's important. According to a press release shared with Cointelegraph, development will feature partnerships with uh, centralized exchanges like Binance and Gate.io. It aims to simplify and expand the use of stable coins to integrate them into daily life and advance the BNB chain's goal of widespread web, web three adoption. It's not just BNB chain, it's stable coin. And it's, the, and it's the layer one that they're actually built on. So the question you're probably asking is, well, who cares because I'm in America, I'm in Canada, I'm in UK, wherever you're actually at, or Australia. Just, and analytically speaking, that's where you're, you're at if you're on my channel. But what about these other countries? And if we're talking about the daily life, I mean, who can actually do this? Because if we're in third world countries, we really can't get this into the hands of the people. No, it's totally incorrect. Did you know, as far as smartphones, this is from Exploding Topics, taking data from Statista. I should have linked this in the description. I will do that later. But it just goes over smart sh smartphone ownership over time. Correct me if I'm wrong in the comment section. We're looking at around 8.1, 8.2 billion people in the world right now. Somewhere around that, I mean, give or take a couple hundred million. But if you take a look at how many people actually have smartphone, smartphone users, 7.4 billion. And you can see the growth over time. In 2017, it was half of the world. Half. And in that time, since 2017, let me do some quick math. Seven years, we almost caught up. Why? Because smartphones don't cost a whole heck of a lot. And they can do a lot of things if you have the connection in there. That's why I believe World Mobile Token is going to be a pretty big, or World Mobile itself, as far as D-Pen, is going to be awesome. Connecting the unconnected. But if you have a smartphone, you can integrate these types of payments and stable coins into your daily lives. And if that's not important, you can spread the dollar. So I don't care what administration is in and what administration is going to make in the United States. I think if they look at this in a clear line and go, okay, how can we con contain and maintain the dollar dominance? This is one of those ways. And you can just see right here, there is a lot of people with a lot of smartphones that can actually do this. Now, some people say, well, well, don't you need a bank to put everything into, in, into those funds? No, you can see, and, you, and you've actually taken a look at World Mobile and what they're doing. They can go to the local kiosk. They can pay in cash for some type of cards. They can take those cards, scan the numbers or put the numbers into their phone, their smartphone, and they have funds into their phone. They don't need a bank. So they can do that, have those funds digitally, transfer those funds around, put them into stables, voila, here we go. Now it's a little bit more complex than that, but I, I just see where things are going. I, I'm hoping, that's what I'm trying to say. So to finish up, who's, who's involved in this initiative? Well, BitGit Wallet and SafePal have already integrated the, the gasless solution, which I gotta tell you, if you're third world country, I mean, every penny counts. So if you can do gasless transactions, how big is that? This is with Binance Web3 Wallet and Trust Wallet expected to join the roster soon. Now we get into regulation, and this is and this will be important in a second. The EU markets in crypto assets regulation, or MICA framework, came into force on June 30th, but will apply to crypto asset service providers from December 30th on. So December 30th in 2025, there's going to be a little clampdown. When the full scale, scope of the EU regulatory framework comes into effect in December, CASPs, again, crypto asset service providers, including crypto exchanges, wallet providers we just talked about, and crypto-related services will be subject to regulatory scrutiny. Ah, they can't make it that easy, can they? BNB chain focuses on maximizing transaction efficiency rather than use issuing or managing stable coins. What this means is they're like, look, you can, you can do all the regulatory issues that you want to as far as CASPs, but that's not us. We're focusing on just transaction efficiency and we're not managing the stable coins. Although, because it is a BNB chain, that's what they're focused on. They're decentralized, or so they say. So if we have something like this, they can say, look, hands off, I'm, you know, if you want to deal with the centralized exchange or something like that, that's on their part. We're just tr providing gasless transactions for stable coins. Anyhow, well, lastly, and I'll, we'll go to the next piece is that uh, we, we, we send this many a times, but again, people will ask me, why do you so into stable coins? 
Not that I'm collecting stable coins so I can get, you know, 0.002% or something. It's, again, the blockchains that it's built on. Ethereum, Tron, Solana, BSC, Avalanche, Arbitrum, Optimus, Polygon, Base. So take a look at those and maybe that could be something to add to your portfolio. Anyhow, that's what we have for that piece. Let me know what you think about that in the comment section. And then also, <laughs> just hang with me. Circle. Circle. Remember 15 to 20% of, of the uh, global market for uh, stable coins. They're in Brazil and Mexico, but it's not just giving the people, they're going through the banks now. You see where I'm going? Previously, the stable coin could only be purchased through crypto exchanges, and now it's through specific banks. So Circle said it will offer USDC stable coins to businesses through integrations with leading banks. PIX in Brazil and SPEI in Mexico are payment systems established by the central bank of each country. This is great for me because we have family in Mexico. And uh, if we want to send things over, I mean, we can use other wallets, but if this is an option and they can go to the bank and, and uh, exchange things, so much the better. Circle has connected its USDC stablecoin with payment systems in Brazil and Mexico for corporate customers through integrations with leading banks, the company said Tuesday. So that is great news, but the thing that will mess it up is what Dennis Porter is talking about, which is regulation. Dennis Porter, if you don't know, CEO and co-founder of Satoshi Act Fund, he's very active in the regulatory environments and uh, trying to spread the good word of Bitcoin and getting it into the hands of the people and, and making lawmakers understand he's doing a great thing. And Dennis says, this was just, uh, this today? No, this is yesterday, uh, 4, 4.20 p.m. He says, I'm talking about Bitcoin in a room of decision makers who oversee three plus trillion dollars in capital. Let your imagination run wild who those are. He said, you'd be surprised how many already hold Bitcoin. And we know this. I mean, we, we know a lot of people up top, they hold Bitcoin. And Terrence asked a good question. He goes, what's keeping them from holding Bitcoin at an entity level as part of their day job, essentially holding everything given to the customers? Dennis Porter says, very simply, it's policy. And that's what it all comes back down to, my friends, the policy. And like I said before, I know that the rate cuts are here and everybody's excited. I'm excited. Hey, let's see what happens. But nothing is really going to change until we get clarity and we can move forward and we figure out which administration is going to be in office. That's just me. So look, that's it for today. If you like today's video, give it a thumbs up. Consider subscribing. Everything we talk about is time sensitive. It's been 13 minutes. Uh, and We'll do a little Q&A and I'll answer all your questions to the best of my abilities. And then we'll jump over to Tom's channel and see just what the heck is going on with the rate cuts as he breaks it down. But if you got to take off, take off. I appreciate you guys and I'll see you on the next one.